Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I am doing fantastic today. We are coming off of a wonderful live show that we did last night. I just wanted to mention that because our virtual backgrounds still have that up. We uh, were with Dr. Shiloh and her daughter, Sydney, talking about Sydney's new podcast, Beyond the Gravestone. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling pretty good. Tim, are you nervous because you have this background behind you still? And there's a bit of a, uh, you know, it's a little ominous. I'm very nervous, but uh, I am not nervous to introduce introduce this conversation with a new friend uh, someone we met recently actually at Obsessed Fest in Columbus, Ohio, the big party that the Obsessed Network threw with mischief management and a lot of friends from the true crime podcast industry. That was such a great time, Lance. And we met Christopher Walker in the green room, and we didn't even know he was the voice that disappeared at the time. We know it now, and we're bringing him here to our audience to speak about some cases that he's passionate about and to just ask him about his career and his work on disappeared. Huge thanks to everybody who organized Obsessed Fest because we wouldn't have been able to have this conversation. I don't even know if we would have thought to reach out to him in the first place to have him on the show. So without Obsessed Fest, we wouldn't have had Chris Walker and we wouldn't have had the connections that we get after Chris Walker. He talks about some cases with us and that prompted us to reach out to family members. So there'll be more down the line because of this conversation, because of this connection with Chris Walker. So we're truly grateful for that. In this conversation, as we mentioned, we're going to speak a little bit about his career career, ask him some questions we kind of really always wanted to ask him. But we're also going to speak about some cases, and we're going to break this conversation up into two parts. Half of this conversation aired on Crawl Space, where we spoke with Chris about the death of Mitrice Richardson. And this is the second half of the conversation. We will be speaking about the disappearance of Pepita Redhair in this one. Although if you listen to the Crawl Space episode, the beginning about Christopher's career is still in this episode as well. And Pepita Madeline Redhair disappeared from Albuquerque, New Mexico on March 27th, 2020. She was 27 at the time of the disappearance, so that would make her 30 years old today. Native American indigenous woman, about 140 pounds, about five foot one inch, brown hair, and if anyone has any information, they are instructed to contact the Albuquerque Police Department at 505 242 2677 or the New Mexico Department of Public Safety Missing Person Hotline 1-800-457-3463. So make sure to follow Christopher Walker on Twitter. It's at Voice of Walker and make sure to check out the new season of Disappeared. It's on Investigation Discovery. And Tim, we have some exciting features on our subscription service for both our shows Missing and Crawl Space. Where can our fine listeners access that? That's right. There is a link in the show notes to access our subscription service, and you'll get ad-free episodes as well as bonus content. Okay, so follow us on social media at Crawl Space Podcast or Crawl Space Pod. Thanks a lot for listening. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Welcome to the podcast, Christopher Walker. How are you today? I'm doing great. It's great to see you guys again. It's so good to see you. And I feel like our relationship was just destined. It was meant to be. And I'm going to give a yeah. quick backstory. We met officially at Obsessed Fest. And our partner in all this, Jennifer Amell, had sent us a picture from her phone of the welcome folder that she got. And it was yours. <laughs> right, right. I forgot that. And then she had it switched around. So she ended up getting hers. And we never made the connection who you were when we got that. Because in our head, we were just like, oh, she got someone else's welcome uh, bag. So that person might have gotten hers. So it was more like trying to figure out where her welcome bag was. And right. then we realized after we spoke with you in the uh, green room who you were. And you're actually the Connecticut River Valley killer. <laughs> I, you know, I, I looked, uh, I, lo you know, I went to your event about uh, Dark Valley, and uh, yes, thank you. A and um, what was the first? The first one was seventy eight or seventy nine? Seventy eight. Okay, so I, I was probably seven or eight. Just it, 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 you know, if we're getting on the record about the likelihood that I actually. <laughs> Thank you for clearing that up. That was my next question. I don't know if that's a spoiler we should have saved for the <laughs> end of today's episode. No, I say we just get it get it out of the way right off the bat. But I am guilty of, of eating all the uh, chocolate and cookies that Jen was supposed to get as part of her <laughs> welcome packet. 
It was, we're good. Yeah. And Obsessed Fest was great. I mean, just to see all these people. We've worked on some of the same things in much different depth, but on some of the same cases that have appeared on Disappeared that you guys have gone into a deeper dive on, you know, and people like Maggie Freeling had worked on some of the same thing. You know, there was just so much overlap. And I, I loved that they just brought in all these different true crime families. You just nailed it. It was like a family event. And I've been telling people what it was. And before we went, I was saying, oh, it's like a true crime podcasting event. But it isn't. It's a podcast family event that just happens to have true crime creators. I wouldn't even say true crime creators. It's mostly advocates that create content in order to promote their advocacy. Yeah. It was such a family environment. Just to 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 fill in what you're saying about advocates, I mean, you've got people like Rabia Chaudhry, Damien Eccles circulating and Laura in circulating in this among the journalists and podcasters, those lines that meet together there. It's a really, really like great space. Yeah, it was a really special event. Thanks again for coming to our Dark Valley presentation. Uh, we really appreciate that. Seeing you uh, in the back of the room there was was a great uh, sign of support for what we were doing. And we had just met earlier that day and just were we're just shooting the S and uh, and you were there. I thought that was really nice. So again, thank you very much. No, I was I was I can't wait to see hear what you guys are doing uh, with that. The in joke that you alluded to early on, just to let people in on that is um, one of the reasons I wanted to, to come see the presentation uh, was because you're talking about the upper Connecticut River Valley. I mean, we say Connecticut River, but we're talking about Vermont, New Hampshire. And so I had told you guys that I, I went to Dartmouth up there in Hanover, New Hampshire, which is in that area. So then we were kind of, you know, speculating about what the chances are I could have been you know, <laughs> behind this series of murders, even though it's a little clarification for the just listeners. Just to give people, you know. Yeah. <laughs> just want to know. That's fair. So people know we were not coming right out of the gate, just throwing accusations at each other. <laughs> well, that's very fair. Thank you for uh, clearing that up for us. It wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> so, uh, so Christopher, tell us a little bit about your work if folks listening at home or in their car don't already recognize your voice. The primary reason I'm here is because, and really the job that has led to so many interesting things in my life is that I voice the show, the Investigation Discovery ID Channel show, Disappeared, which covers missing persons cases, uh, which first premiered in uh, 2009 and has um, sort of been soft canceled and brought back several times and brought back without me, then brought back with me. It's come back as specials, went away for a long time and just uh, came back for a 10th season this year, which is now airing and is almost completed. That's part of my work as a, a narrator and announcer, which came out of my work as an actor, voiceover actor, audiobook person. But really, yeah, landing in disappeared at, at pretty much close to the outset of ID Channel's existence uh, has really just been kind of the gift that keeps on giving. And that, that in turn led to, um, you know, you mentioned Obsessed Fest and Patrick before. They started a show called Obsessed with Disappeared that was kind of a spun off from their core true crime obsessed. They went and recapped and covered our show going back to those first 2009 episodes. Also talked about, you know, updates in the case. And they're, they're, it's also a media critique. They're, they're critiquing uh, what we as a channel did and our, our recreations. And, you know, my, you know, they're making fun of my narrations as if I've, you know, written them myself um which you know again if we're for doing the record like you know I actually did not write occasionally i would fix grammar and, and help them out with you know things like that but i was not writing that <laughs> um and then i got this tweet that said hey are people tell us you're the narrator guy is that right and i i said yes and i said this is going to sound crazy but we do a comedy podcast about your missing persons show. And I said, all right, uh, you know, a little bit of a raised eyebrow on that, but I, I checked it out and I saw what they were doing. There's full sympathy for victims and families and what, you know, where the comedy comes from is the interaction of the hosts, certain amount of laughing at, at the wigs that they put on the recreations of, of people on ID Channel, that kind of thing. And so they interviewed me and then I began sort of guesting out on the show and playing around with them a little bit. And then I ended up at, uh, at Obsessed Fest doing improv with them where I'd narrate things that they would act out as improv actors. So 
it, it's really just been, you know, part of the crazy journey of disappeared. And you fully expected this to happen in your career trajectory, right? Yeah, I expected podcasting to exist. I saw the future. Yeah, around that time, I I think I mentioned this before we were rolling, but uh, you know, I was laid off from a, a journalism job at one point and had been working as an actor and and voiceover person before that. Uh, right around the time I got laid off from that, I got this strange, and I had been do- doing Disappeared for a few years. I got this strange offer from a, a South African advertising company that had a, a contract with a, a chicken restaurant chain. They said, we're doing a uh, an ad campaign, it's mockumentary style, where this guy sort of gets lost looking for this... Um, looking for the purpose of life, and he finds this great deal on fried chicken. So I did that, and that was sort of the first self-parody that people hired me to do, where I'm kind of making fun of what I do on Disappeared. There were a couple others that came along the way after that. I think an MTV or VH1 show called Guy Code and Girl Code, and whoever was writing it, you know, was, like a lot of people, obsessed with Disappeared, and they had written a little Disappeared parody and found it and brought me in on that. So I would not have guessed that it led down this road. So I was working as an actor in Washington, D.C., stage acting and trying to figure out, so how do these people who have their families and everything and work as an actor in in D.C.? And a lot of them were doing voiceover. Uh, A certain amount of them were doing political ads and that kind of work. There's a lot of industrial film in D.C. Like Troy McClure is always doing on The Simpsons. You know, he's like doing, you know... (laughs) There's a lot of that, except it's very government. It's like how to clean your missiles films, training films, and that kind of thing. So people were doing that, and and Discovery and its whole family was here in the area. So people did narration as well. And I had a friend in theater. She went into documentary working at kind of the lowest, like, PA-type level. And I said, how do you get into these? Um, how do people do that? I, I had a demo for narration. She sort of kept me in mind. And then someone she knew was doing a show for A&E about really a true crime story. It was uh, part of the Unsolved History series. And they were looking at who turned in Anne Frank to the Nazis. So that was sort of my first narration job. I found out from the director that, that she had worked previously with Donald Sutherland. And, you know, I think that was kind of her first choice. But she sort of clued me into, like, what he was doing in terms of the narration, in terms of not overblowing it and trying to dig in and and relate on a conversational level to tell this story. Then this friend who had gotten into documentary, she started working for Discovery. She worked for a channel called Discovery Times. And this was when Discovery, the main channel, was starting to do... There weren't, you know, documentaries as much anymore. It was all turning into shows about, like, families of guys in garages making cars and arguing with each other. There wasn't any room for sort of straight documentary on the channel anymore. And Discovery Times was a partnership with New York Times. They started to do really interesting documentaries. And I did a bunch of work for them, which I loved doing. And then that channel failed financially and they turned it into, they said, let's try out true crime here. And that became ID. And, you know, somewhere in their first year or so, they put me on Disappeared. And I don't think any of us knew that it was going to just, like, have legs. But it was one of their ongoing things, along with, like, Paul Lazan and Homicide Hunter, that just, like, kept going. What do you think it is about Disappeared that people get obsessed with? It's your voice. I mean, obviously. Clearly not. Although, I think, like, you know, how, like, baby ducks, like, program onto the mother. I think I benefit from sort of that effect. People got used to me being on there and rode with it. You know, it's interesting because I've also talked to people who are like, oh, I can't do unresolved cases. There's a certain sort of mentality that you either like, this is something unresolved and I, I have that armchair detective need to like look at this and say, the husband looks really sketchy or this looks like, you know, they took their own life or whatever the sort of paths are. It's not pointing toward one thing. There are people who just gravitate to that. And obviously that's a lot of the true crime They call it the ID addict on the channel. I know part of the thing for me when I engage with the material directly or going back to look at it, it's always like, can some of these get resolved? But, you know, the idea that, like, if we put this out there, maybe we can find and help some people. That's what happens in my head, and I think that might be 
what happens in a lot of people's heads as well. I think that's a big element to it, that there's a possibility to actually help somebody. It fills something in you. If, you're, yeah. if you've are if you been looking into these cases and you've been watching and listening to the shows and the podcasts and, hey, I actually contributed to this. Like, that's a, that's a great feeling and it does no harm. Is Maura Murray the first thing you guys dug in on? Yeah, I mean, officially as a podcast, yeah. Is that the same for you? Is it that you looked at this and said, that, you know, this is unresolved? Sort of question back at you. Sure. When we initially got involved, we were really interested in the community that built up around the case. It had been long said that there could be answers in the online community. And then when we started doing the podcast, it kind of caught on a little bit. Yeah, we refocused to be less about the culture. That case is a good example. It's family and the way that the families and the other loved ones left behind when somebody goes missing, what they're going through. Also what they, in some cases, choose to take on in terms of like, okay, I'm going to advocate for myself. I'm going to figure out how to navigate this situation where maybe the police have made a mistake or maybe the, you know, maybe the investigators are not looking at this for some reason. Another good example of that is what Bruce Maitland has done with his forming of private investigations for the missing, which Tim and I are affiliated with. And he just went right to the basic of what didn't I have that I needed when law enforcement dropped this down their priority list. And it was a private investigator. And he was like, that's what people need. So we're going to start an organization that will help to provide this service to families who need and can't afford a private investigator. You sent us a few cases that you wanted to discuss. You know, I don't know if you get to discuss them at all. We're happy to uh, be one of those places that you get to do that. In that obsessed fest and obsessed world, like they've sort of, you know, by bringing me into the show, they've sort of highlighted me. So sometimes when I'm talking to people there or talking to people online, people do want to know sort of what interests me. And, you know, I think sometimes people ask what, what your favorite cases, um, which I'm not knocking them saying that, but, you know, it's sort of hard when it's all, it's, there's so much tragedy. And in fact, because of that, I think, you know, some of the things that I, I've pointed to in the past, like in, in interviews with um, Ellen and at that time, uh, Patrick Hines was on the, on that podcast, point to some of the, the things that have, that are a little bit a trick to, to my mind in, in that they're, they're things that have been resolved. And so a couple of the positive resolution cases, obviously I like that because somebody was found in looking at the whole body of cases because, you know, you just start to see some of the same patterns. And I know you guys, even just looking at, at the two cases that we mentioned in, in New Hampshire and Vermont, you know, you start to see sort of patterns in the way that law enforcement deal with people, in the way that media deal with a case, in the kinds of things that a family has to go through. What happens when you're dealing with situations where there is addiction or maybe there's been a pattern of abuse somewhere around somebody. So just starting to see the way that people go through a lot of the same things on these cases. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Christopher, tell us about the new season of Disappeared. I understand you covered a case, the disappearance of Pepita Redhair. Can you tell us a little bit about that? One of the cases we deal with in the current season is Pepita Redhair. And Pepita Redhair is a Navajo woman uh, living in the Albuquerque area. And she grew up on a reservation about an hour from there. And her mother, Anita King, uh, and her sister, Sheldon Livingston, we see them in the show. And they both uh, still live in that area. Uh, but Pepita Redhair was last seen on March 24th, 2020, when her mother brought her back from a visit to their home, brought her back to Albuquerque, where Pepita was living with her boyfriend, Nick, and uh, my understanding is with his family as well. And in this family, and this may not be true for your family or uh, or mine, but um, you know, the mother explains that she pretty much texted or otherwise messaged, possibly talked with her. It sounded like pretty much every day. Um, so she dropped her off, and then uh, the next day, no text, no call. Um, 
same the next day. And then on the 27th, there was still nothing. Um, she finally got a hold of this boyfriend, Nick, and all he told her at that point, according to her, is that Pepita, she left. So the 24th of March, which COVID restrictions were surfacing at that point in this country. And that was the last so far that anyone has heard from Pepita Redhair. And so we hear from the mother and the sister. We don't have comment from Nick on the episode. We have a specific um, note in the episode that uh, the Albuquerque police, it's Albuquerque and um, uh, Bernalillo County, that uh, they did not speak with the show or with producers on this episode. We get something that I, I'm, I'm sure you guys have, uh, have seen in some of these missing persons cases. I think, did we even have it? We didn't mention it, but did we even have it on Mytrice Richardson? This thing, this drives um, Ellen and Joey over on the OWD podcast crazy as well when they hear it, but you hear it all the time uh, with adult missing persons cases is, uh, well, they're, they're an adult. They have every right in the world to go, yep. Yep, exactly. They have every right to go missing. And especially when you run into this, and this seems to change jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but when you run into it in concert with, um, well, you can't report someone missing until they've been missing, and in some cases, 24 hours. In some cases, you might hear from a, a different jurisdiction, you might hear 48 hours. There seems to be a lot of, uh, there's not a consistent standard on that. So I think seeing those two things in concert, especially when, when the families or whoever's looking into it, you know, have suspicions about what might have happened, um, that something, you know, nefarious might have happened in the case. It's just, it's sort of a maddening dynamic. Um, this idea that, you know, you're an adult, you have a right to go missing. And when, you know, the other thing that we see is that things are so much more likely to be resolved if they're investigated immediately, that first 48-hour window they talk about. So what you see in this case is this thing uh, we talked about a little bit with a couple of the cases you guys have looked at in New England, um, the need for the family to... Uh, jump in and take the reins because nobody's doing anything. So they they were told she has a right to go missing. And so they're pretty much right out there um, putting flyers out in the areas in and around where Pepita had lived and worked. They're getting, you know, right on the um, right on the search immediately. And we hear from a couple experts on this episode that I think lend a lot of perspective that, that maybe we didn't see this kind of perspective on on older seasons of the show. We get this reporter, Sean Griswold, from uh, Source, New Mexico, and he's a Pueblo citizen. And he really gives us a lot of perspective on a lot of the elements of racism here in terms of the way this is investigated or not, uh, in terms of the way this community is looked at. Um, I don't know how much you guys have, have looked at other, other cases or situations, but where the, the native and indigenous populations are just the rates at which they go missing versus the rates at which those cases are investigated. Yeah. I mean, it is an epidemic. Here and in Canada, yes. uh, for sure. I mean, there are whole investigations on on this dynamic. It's interesting that you mentioned that here and in Canada because both countries are really coming to terms with it and having a difficult time doing it because they need to overcome such deep-seated cultural, uh, even subconscious racism. I mean, a lot of the people don't even realize that these things are racist and they need to be told that and then they need to overcome. I'll just use a obvious example, changing the name of the football team in Washington from the Redskins to the command. What are they now? The commander? No, that's yeah, um, commanders. The commanders. That's okay. right. 
I remember when that was happening and people were like, well, it's always been the Redskins. Like, come on, it's always been the Redskins. And it's like, well, why don't you look into history just a little further and find out where that term yeah. came from? So it's just interesting that you mentioned that uh, and brought Canada into it as well, because not a lot of people accept it yet on both sides of the border. And you look at, you know, you look at some of the 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 history and we think of we think of it in terms of, oh, it's it's distant history. But if you look at uh, if you look at Canada and you look at do you know Connie Walker's work at all on the missing and murdered indigenous women in Canada there? Yeah. Yeah. And and some of the history that's just, you know, in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And, 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 when, and I'm not just talking about, you know, people's racism, but but actual structures and government actions in terms of uh, like they're they're um, taking children away from native people. You know, that's that's really recent stuff that they're they're butting up against. Yeah. And, and not not saying that everybody is racist and they don't want this to happen. I think the majority of people on both sides of the border want this to happen. It's just coming to terms with it is tough. Coming to terms with your your country's dark history. It's not taught to you. So when you learn it, about it in various ways, those ways are pretty brutal. The, you know, you rip the Band-Aid off and you say, wow, this is something we were responsible for. I mean, you know, generationally. And people don't even want to face, you know, let alone dark history, but just sort of current, as you were saying, these, these current biases that, um, that happen, that exist, that are, that are set in place in these places. And so one thing we have in this episode along with Sean Griswold, I'd be interested to know how the family came to work with her. But we have this woman, uh, Darlene Gomez, I think. She's the family advocate for um, Pepita Redhair's family, for her her mother and sister, but also works, you know, on murdered and missing indigenous women cases and, you know, works in this way in general. So she's also there in this episode uh, shining the light on, on the hoops that the family is going through. We have Sean Griswold talking about uh, how Albuquerque in particular has been an area that uh, the Department of Justice has looked at in terms of systemic racism toward the Native population. So the other thing that the family is struggling with here, the other hoop that they're, they're shining the light on here, is they can't get media attention either. So they're already dealing with, uh, the police aren't dealing with this, we're doing our own searches, and now, you know, they just can't get attention uh, from the media, you know, and they, they talk about the, the built-in bias there as well. And, you know, as we get later in the episode, um, and this happens on a couple episodes this season with different stories, um, with both with people of color, they talk about the, uh, the Gabby Petito news broke and suddenly that's got national attention all the media are are chasing down the Gabby Petito story and this family is sitting here looking at this saying you know we've been trying to get this kind of attention you know for months now in this case again they're they're doing their own work so they're they're driving by Nick's house the sister Sheldon is driving by Nick's house uh, nobody's answering there. We find out from them later that um, the police have interviewed Nick once and um, and only once. And, you know, from at least the script of the episode, um, the indication is that the police are not um, had not made Nick a suspect. So then we see the family out searching in the desert areas they're they're you know they're wearing rubber gloves and picking through trash the police say they won't um you know they won't send dogs out uh to do you know any kind of cadaver search uh so you really see that this family like having to work through this entire situation on their own again all too often you get this blend of circumstances you have a Native American young woman, you have that particular community, you have law enforcement, and then you have time, and then you have just this unfortunate incident with Gabby Petito that takes attention away from all of these other cases. So this is just something that you always hear about, and it just keeps folding into itself. 
and I just uh, checked um, Pepita's mom, Anita King, has a GoFundMe. So we'll put the link in the show notes for that as well to uh, to help with this. And again, going back to Bruce Maitland, like this was the most obvious need. And it doesn't matter where you're from or your cultural or your your social circles that you that you run with. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter what your nationality is. Like this always seems to happen if you're not a certain type of person. Yeah, um, I'm wondering too if maybe it's possible to link uh, Source New Mexico and Sean Griswold's work because I don't know if, if you had the same experience, but I was trying to do you know the outside the show homework and find more on this case. And there, there were some interesting um, developments, not in terms of, of finding her, but in terms of what sh- them shining some attention on this case has resulted in. But I wasn't really seeing other coverage other than this, this really small, you know, sort of scrappy news outlet that might just be Sean Griswold sitting by himself writing about this. But so there was, there was a rally where they talk about, um, you know, generally the case of missing and murdered indigenous women. But then also that has led to this this task force. Did you see this? That, that's um, It's a coming together of the State Bureau of Indian Affairs and I believe the county, poli- the Bernalillo County Police, if I've got that right. And they're uh, working together to create a task force that's going to focus on these issues. Now, what the efficacy of that is, what's going to come from that, I think, you know, probably remains to be seen. But that seems to be something that's that's come out of the the community groundswell uh, from this case. That's great. I mean, it really sucks that it took this to create something like that. But, you know, again, small victories. We'll take it. That's great. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. And the other thing I want to point to in this case that I, I feel like uh, not mentioning it, I've sort of, uh, you know, uh, brushed over it, is that there there's some indications. And I, I think you've just got to watch uh, watch the episode or, you know, read some of the news items about this case. But there's some suggestions that there was a domestic abuse situation here, which makes it sort of even more critical that they they try to look at this in a timely manner, which at this point, you know, we're now several years past. Yeah, definitely. That that was a concerning element uh, when I watched the episode. And also uh, the possibility of trafficking came up, which, um, which I always find uh, terrifying and uh, I feel like I can't learn enough about it. Yeah, that's been a theme that that has come out over the series as we see that in. Well, I didn't that wasn't that uh, come up in some of your work? Sure. Yeah, it's it's hard to cover missing people and and not um, at least come against, you know, rub up against the topic. Um, but it's it's also like hard to put your hand on and like uh, go in specifically on it because there's I think it's a very wide topic and a lot of people out there perpetrating these kind of things and just a lot of people doing different things with it, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm curious what your impression in watching this episode was in terms of drugs. And I feel like, you know, and and one thing I should mention in case people aren't, aren't watching or haven't seen the current season is um, they've really reduced the amount of narration that's involved. So we're not, we're not having me step in and voice the producers uh, links. And I think part of what they've done is they've had the family members or whoever they're interviewing in each case, fill in a little bit of the storyline. And, uh, you know, some of the timelines are done in terms of visuals and sort of telling you what day it is or what the location is. So I, I think the the issue of drugs and drug addiction feel felt to me like they were touched on, but in a very delicate way. And I was wondering if, if what you guys had the same impression. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem like drugs were a huge factor in Pepita's disappearance. 
but that's just my take on it. I I think it's super unfortunate that anytime, not anytime, I feel like I've said so many things that run the uh, line of, uh, like I, I might get some shit for saying things like, anyway, I feel like it's unfortunate when at times media will cover Native American communities and a missing person within that community. And the, one of the first things you hear about is their problems with addiction and drugs and alcohol. And then that automatically puts it at the front of your brain that that had something to do with it. And it might have, it might not have, but it's almost like an easy way to, not easy, but it's almost like a way to shade it. And then, you know, well, it's, it's that problem for those people. And then again, you've marginalized the whole situation and it's no longer a priority. And back to the sort of hierarchy thing we were talking about, you know, we, you know, consciously or subconsciously, there's a tendency to, to like with mental illness or you might say like with other mental illness, you know, we look at an addiction situation and and, you know, maybe some people are saying like, well, no wonder that happened. You know, there's there's some there's a there's a type of bias that's happened where it's like, yeah, well, you know, because this is a situation where drugs were involved, this was in some way more likely or inevitable. And going back to what I said earlier, like we shouldn't be looking at these as any less valuable lives because something like that might be involved. Yeah, it's frustrating. And um, this case in particular is frustrating, I feel like, because Pepita's boyfriend wasn't interviewed by the by law enforcement. He was once. OK, we we suggest that he was he was interviewed once. And I should have written down the exact phrasing, but um, that they weren't. I believe my, my impression was that they weren't looking at him as a suspect. Well, maybe they should. Maybe they should. Well, then you couple in domestic abuse in that and it becomes even more unsavory yeah it be you know you don't again getting to that that hierarchy that's you know you can't really solve it by listening to a podcast or watching an episode of something there's something deeper there and if you look at the mom and the sister here and and take what they're telling us like clearly they're looking that direction in terms of you know what happened here yeah i mean the the abuse i would say is very suspicious right before uh she went missing and pepita had a friend um who witnessed it unfortunately that that person is not with us anymore this is the guy referenced in the episode uh uh laramie yes and if i understand it right it sounded like nick pointed brought up laramie's name to police is that was that your understanding I'm not sure. That was my understanding. It's interesting. I I, I watch these episodes differently. It used to be that I'd I'd watch sort of a um, a full cut of the episode, and there might be a scratch track with an editor doing you know whatever narration I'm going to end up doing or an approximation of it, and so I'd kind of be more immersed in it, um, in what the whole story was going to be, and it at this point in the current version of the show, it's more of a cold opening. It's kind of an intro to what the case is overall. So when I watch the whole episode, it's a little more like uh, a whole new thing. I'm watching it more like anybody else is than I was the old version of the show. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and I also feel like your regular voice is much different than your narration voice. So even though we're talking with the voice of Disappeared, I feel like we're just talking to another podcaster and uh, and not the actual narrator. It was a brisk October day <laughs> in New Hampshire. Whoa! There it is. <laughs> You're that Chris Walker. <laughs> <laughs> they give me a lot of crap on OWD about how much weather description I do. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody talks about this cliche now because it's such a cliche for so many years and not just on Disappeared. But uh, also anytime somebody is described as lighting up a room or being a free spirit. <laughs> yes. I mean, we used to do and And in sort of reviewing some of these episodes or, or reviewing them via listening to OWD's work. Uh, wow. We did that a lot. We described a lot and, and a lot of other a lot of other true crime media does it. Yeah. 
They do a yeah. lot, and a lot of times it's true. It's like the the family members you're you're <laughs> asking, is. you know, they're remembering the best things about these people, um, you know, their loved yeah. ones. Yeah. So I do think it's true, but it is funny how you just can't say it nowadays. Like, <laughs> you know, you'll be if you, if we were to say that on the podcast, we'd get we'd get laughed out of you know we'd we'd get comments. Absolutely. I feel like it happened like overnight too. I feel like really one day did. it was fine and the next day it was like the worst thing you could say. <laughs> <laughs> I I guess that's just so much, you know, secondary exposure that that uh this media is getting from other from the podcast world of looking at so many of these documentaries and shows. Yeah. I'm wondering um I don't know if you'll have any insight into this, but from the production uh side of things when the crew was shooting and producing this with um, Pepita's family and going to the location. Did they, what, what reception did they get? Do you have any idea like what kind of reception they got? Were they welcomed or were they greeted with some uh, maybe a little skepticism? I don't, I don't there. I'm so late in on the process and I think we're just sort of, you know, running to get my part done that uh that I don't get a lot. It used to be that I I'd sort of spend a little more time with the producers even just you know over a line like this um that you know if something unusual happened I might hear about it but uh not in the in the current season man cuz maybe it's just the way in which you narrate but I really feel like you're there I I feel like the way you narrate is like wow don't they get annoyed with him narrating when, you know, right there next to them? <laughs> camera pulls back and I'm standing <laughs> in the getting, desert with them describing you're slightly what's going behind on. camera. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, we know it's 67 degrees and partly cloudy. Thanks. Stop writing your own copy. Get out of here. <laughs> we have to do this uh, again. This has been really fun. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. That's another one of the things that we can't say. I can't say like I, it's been really fun talking about these <laughs> right, missing it's individuals not fun. and I know right um, right yeah it's not fun. Thank you so much, Christopher, for uh, hanging Thanks out. Thanks for with having us. me. This yeah, is great. and uh, everyone needs to watch the new season of Disappeared. I'm sure it is going to be great. If it's anything like uh, the rest of the series, yeah, please come and join us. I think they are examining things from a new perspective compared to older seasons and I, I just love the kind of work that they're doing as producers in terms of cases like this in particular where the, where these things have not had enough light shown on them and and I'm glad that they're they're turning their attention that way and highlighting these things like what gets more media attention versus what doesn't so I think it's a good direction <laughs>